Okay, so it looks like we reached the stable number of attendees. Um, so welcome everybody to another edition of the Lynx Data Science Research Webinar. Today, Mark Grimes from the University of Montana, principal investigator on one of uh, Lynx external data science research projects. We'll talk about unraveling network hairballs. Please, Mark, go ahead. So after the Lynx meeting, I was um, at the Rally for Medical Research, struggling for ways to describe what I do when meeting with my congressional delegation on Capitol Hill. And the concept of the hairball kind of stuck, because people can visualize that, right? You have a picture of it. And so that's why I've titled it Unraveling Hairballs. This is a collaboration between people from Cell Signaling Technology Clarissa Rakova did the experiments. Peter and Ben have been wrangling the data. Peter Hornbeck and Nick Fernandez from Avi's lab have been um, <clears throat> trying to do some work on this cluster grammar. Neil Clark provided uh, insight into how to use um, a uh, matrix factorization technique, penalized matrix decomposition, which he described uh, in a seminar a couple months ago. And Andrew and Avi have been supporting in other ways with um, networks. So uh, basic idea is we've got holy data. Mass spectrometry um, detectors pull peaks stochastically, fragment them, and they leave holes in the data because the peaks that they pull are, are sort of random each time. So we figured out a way to surmount the holy data problem. And we thought a lot about how to cluster holy data because we want to use a cluster filtered edges approach to look at pathways based on post-translational modification data. The ability to pull down phosphotyrosine from peptide uh, launched this uh, field called phosphoproteomics. And uh, cell signaling technology has uh, developed some really good antibodies for phosphoproteomics. And I've used these in a previous study with neuroblastoma cell lines. Um, since that time, they have other modification-specific antibodies. So they can sample uh, uh, serine uh, phosphorylation, acetylation, and methylation. And what Clarissa did is an experiment where um, it's called tandem mass tag where they uh, compare, uh, in a six-plex uh, experiment, uh, samples to a control sample. And there's two sets of experiments. One is lung cancer cell lines compared to normal tissue. And the other is uh, lung cancer cell lines treated with drugs over a time course. The, the tandem mass tag, in brief, um, covalently labels peptides with a mass tag so that the samples can be mixed and then uh, immunoprecipitated with uh, phospho-specific antibodies for tyrosine, serine threonine phosphorylation, and then arginine methylation, lysine methylation, and lysine acetylation. The mixing of samples means that when, you, when the mass spectrometer selects a peak, it selects a mixture of all the mass tags, which are then resolved later. And the ratio is a robust measurement. So Upon fragmentation in MS2 or MS3, uh, the mass tag is evident, and you can unravel which sample it came from. And so the ratios are robust. And that's really all you get. And I think that's important to emphasize here, because uh, if you're used to looking at levels of phosphorylation or um, gene expression, this is, a different, uh, this is a different animal. It's a different set of data. And we can talk about. Um, some of the nuts and bolts of that later if you want. But it's important to remember that we're looking at ratios here. Uh, so the data are uh, 54 lung cancer cell lines, including small cell, which is derived from the neural crest, and non-small cell, which is derived from other sources like epithelial tissue. And again, they're compared to normal tissue. And six of the non-small uh, cell cancer cell lines and one gastric car carcinoma were treated with NIBs, three NIBs, and this drug galdenamycin, which um, inhibits heat shock 90 proteins. And we did a time course. 
where Clarissa did the experiment. So here's what the data looks like. This is one experiment, excuse me. And this is ERESA treated H3255 cells. And ERESA uh, inhibits EGFR, so reassuringly the phosphorylation of EGFR uh, goes down. I'm graphing these as heat maps where uh, the control is on the left and down is blue and up is yellow. So here are the perturbogens, chrysotinib, which inhibits MET and ALK, ERESA, EGFR, and relatives, and gildenomycin, the HSP90 uh, uh, family of proteins, and Gleevec inhibits PDGFR, A, and also a few other things. So Nick and uh, Peter are working on kinase enrichment analysis based on substrate phosphorylation and also grouping cell lines uh, based on gene expression and, and known uh, drivers uh, and comparing that to the protein modification data. Nick has this really cool tool he calls Cluster Grammar and here's the link to it. And what he's developing is a way to explore the data using uh, you, these uh, slider tools that you can group cells using clustering in different ways and um, it's a very nice tool and it's, it's still in development but it's looking very promising. So I've been focusing on clustering and um, because of these two sort of underpinning hypotheses, that is clustering of modifications under different conditions reveals patterns specific to the system, which is in this case lung cancer cell lines. And then we're going to use those clusters that are identified by statistical relationships and use those to filter pathways from protein-protein interaction databases. So clusters identified by statistical relationships that contain proteins known to interact with one another, we hope are likely to represent functional signaling pathways. And what we wanted to do in dealing with the holy data is uh, focus on the data that we have without making assumptions about the missing data and also without throwing out a lot of data. And we found that using this t machine learning uh, pattern recognition algorithm called TSNE, we can rigorously define clusters based on protein modifications. And it's important to rigorously define clusters because we want to use those clusters to filter networks of protein-protein interactions to model molecular signaling pathways. And um, we can, because we've got different types of modification, we can identify pathways that involve, in addition to phosphorylation, acetylation, and methylation. And what kind of came out of this is that there, are, there seem to be key proteins that are in, in many pathways that we call hubs that are likely to be nodes for signaling, uh, signal integration. And these might make good targets later for therapeutic intervention. So a, a brief summary for how we dealt with the holy data problem, the missing data, is we treat the data as NA, that is data not available, using R, and then calculate the relationships using pairwise complete observation, penalizing incomplete observations in dissimilarity representations by giving them a large value. So I've said a mouthful there, and um, we can come back to that if there are questions later. But basically, we're saying that incomplete observations are highly dissimilar uh, compared to complete observations. And then we embed these statistical relationships into a, a three-dimensional data structure using TSNE, and then define the structure that define the clusters as nearest neighbors in this embedding. And then uh, taking a, a tip from Neil Clark, we uh, found that an additional penalized matrix decomposition step uh, followed by another TSNE uh, helps further parse clusters. And so here's some examples of how the clusters look. And these again are heat maps where uh, up is, uh, is yellow and down is blue. And on the, uh, on the rows are different modifications and you probably can't read them. And the experiments are in the columns. And the important point is, is that um, by penalizing incomplete observations, we get many clusters with few or uh, none uh, NAs, which are represented in black here. Um, so this, this really defines clusters that are um, 
that are less, you know, so the, the entire data set is 78% NA, and the clusters are far less NA. But importantly, um, the NA is not the only thing that's driving clustering. Sometimes you'll get clusters like this one on the right that I'm trying to point to here, where this is mainly two experiments, uh, six plexes. And then some of those modification sites are uh, also distributed in some other experiments. So the bottom line from this is that the penalizing uh, the incomplete observation gives rise to clusters that are more, much more complete than the entire data set. But that's not the only thing that matters for clustering. We, we did a lot of work evaluating this, this method of uh, pairwise complete clustering. And we determined that the clusters are significantly more likely than random sets of uh, modifications or proteins from the data to have proteins that interact with one another or have common gene ontology terms. And the TSNE worked much better than k-means and fuzzy clustering and some other things that we tried. And so the bottom line is, is that clustering using TSNE embeddings from this penalized pairwise complete dissimilarity matrices identifies proteins known to interact with one another. And we can, if there's questions, we can return to that. But um, the, uh, the underpinning uh, evaluations and methods are published in these two papers. And we can come back to that uh, later if you want. I'd like to focus now on how we use these clusters uh, to, to model data structure as networks. And there's a couple of ways to do that. One is to, to make a co-cluster correlation network of protein modifications. Another way is to use um, cluster filtered interactions to filter protein interactions by excluding all edges except those between proteins whose modifications co-cluster. So that's, that's, I've said a mouthful there, and I have a couple of slides to explain that a little bit further. Um, and then what we can use in this cluster filtered network is use shortest path algorithms um, in, in the cluster filtered network to look at specific pathways between proteins based on their modifications. So um, I've been graphing these data, these networks using R and uh, R Cytoscape, and then graphing them in Cytoscape. And this is an example of uh, co-cluster correlation. So the proteins are in black, and their modifications are sort of sticking out from them. And some of their modifications correlate with one another, as indicated by these yellow edges. Or they might anti-correlate with one another, as indicated by these blue edges. And so we formally uh, define the, the modification site co-cluster correlation network as edges that um, cluster together from this rigorous uh, clustering and um, <clears throat> whose Spearman correlation is greater than uh, the absolute value of two-thirds. And the entire, the entire co-cluster correlation network from the data set looks like this. It's a little bit unwieldy to try to graph and explore, but we have this um, underneath, uh, we have this, this structure in R, and then we can use that to to explore individual pathways. So we wanted to use this clustering of protein modifications to filter protein-protein interaction edges. And the PPI edges that we use are from several different sources, Pathway Commons, Bioplex, this is a, Steve Gigi's a recent um, protein interaction network, String, uh, Phosphocyte, the kinase substrate network, Gene Mania, and we focus on physical and pathway interactions. We don't include co-expression or text mining. We also found it, um, it good to exclude genetic interactions because those are, um, they can be indirect and we wanted to focus on direct or pathway uh, interactions. And there's still, there's a lot of edges here, so we filter the edges between proteins whose modifications co-cluster. And let me illustrate that in a slide here. So if we have a protein-protein interaction network, so that the, the circles are proteins, and the red lines are protein-protein interactions from one of these databases. We, also, we combine that with the co-cluster modification network. And so that's depicted here. So two modifications that uh, both correlate and co-cluster using this TSNE method 
uh, <clears throat> are shown with this yellow edge. And so what we do is we uh, filter out the edge that doesn't have modifications that co-cluster. And so that's what we call the cluster filter network, if you will. And uh, when I graph these, I use the node shape and border to signify protein type. For example, we have receptor tyrosine kinases and membrane proteins in this shape, kinases and phosphatases in as polygons, phosphatases with a yellow border, kinases with a red, and some other proteins. And the edges have different colors too. Uh, again, we're focusing on uh, phosphorylation or direct um, uh, pathway or direct uh, in complex with interactions, excluding genetic interactions and some of these other ones. So to illustrate how this cluster filtered network works, here are all on the left, all the tyrosine kinases in the data set. And the node size and color indicates the relative phosphorylation compared to normal lung tissue. And the, all the edges are shown here, and it's really, there's a lot of interactions. Protein tyrosine kinases are well studied, so there's a lot of known interactions between them, among them. <clears throat> if we filter out all except those whose modifications co-cluster, we have far fewer edges. And so we're focusing in on interactions that are likely to be happening based on the modifications in the data in these lung cancer cell lines. So I'll tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I'll tell you. Um, the data offer the unique opportunity to study uh, different post-translational modifications at the same time, so methylation and acetylation, in addition to um, kinases and phosphoproteins. And uh, the bottom line is that we, this rigorous clustering and, and applying that to, to networks to make cluster filtered networks, and then using shortest paths, it, it elucidates some pathways that make biological sense. And I'll show you several of those in a second here. Um, and then in this, in this network, the properties of degree and betweenness identify key hubs that are likely nodes for signal integration. They're proteins that seem to be in many pathways. And I'll illustrate that with a couple of examples. And then we found that these translational modifications, especially phosphorylation and acetylation, appear to play dueling or antagonistic roles for some signaling proteins. And gildenomycin, this is a drug that the mechanism of action has been somewhat uh, uh, obscure. It seems to affect acetyltransferases, which disrupts regulation of the cytoskeleton and endocytosis to affect specific signaling pathways. Just to make sure we're on the same page about what shortest paths are, shortest paths are uh, what is the, the quickest way to get from node 125 to node 1 over here? And the shortest path is the, the path that takes the fewest uh, nodes in between. <coughs> and. Um, and so several nodes have, um, uh, are in a lot of shortest paths, and those are said to have a high betweenness or betweenness centrality. In other words, um, when a number of uh, shortest paths go through them, then their betweenness is high. And degree is uh, related. Degree is the number of connections each node has. So this node, 48 in the middle, has three connections whereas this node 125 only has one, so it has degree one, and this has degree three. So if we use this cluster filtered network, again, we're zooming in on a protein-protein interaction network that has been filtered based on the protein modifications co-clustering. Um, here are three examples. So this is ALK uh, up in the upper left to all of the histones in the data set. And this is the shortest path um, to each of the histones. And similarly, this is EGFR and MET to the, all of the histones. And what you can see is that um, ALK is closer to some histones than other histones. And EGFR is closer to a different set of histones. And similarly, MET is also uh, has its own distinct path to these histone proteins. What I've graphed here, we, we, when I was doing this, I noticed uh, a couple of things. I noticed that, for example, um, this 14 
3-3 protein called uh, YWHAZ, it's 14-3-3 zeta, came up a lot. And I looked up some papers about this. I didn't know this when I started, but it turns out that the 14-3-3 proteins are involved in histone modifications. And th there are some known interactions there based on experimental evidence. And there are a couple other proteins. The HSP90 is another one. They seem to come up a lot on these paths. And so I looked into betweenness. And so now I've graphed node size as betweenness and node degree as color. So more yellow has a higher degree and size is betweenness. And so a few of these proteins seem to come up a lot on different paths. And um, here's another example. So Nick was looking at the cancer cell line encyclopedia, and this is from his cluster grammar website. And he noticed that two transcription factors uh, rank highly in, uh, in their changes in lung cancer cell lines. NKX2-1 is, is upregulated. Uh, uh, yeah, red is up. And uh, SMARC A4 is downregulated frequently in these lung cancer cell lines. Those two transcription factors also happen to be modified in our data set. And here's their modifications. So uh, RME stands for arginine methylation. AC stands for uh, lysine acetylation. And P stands for phosphorylation. So that means that we can ask, what are the connections from those two transcription factors to all of the receptor tyrosine kinases. And so this is a, this is a composite of all of those shortest paths. And um, again, we see that there are um, several proteins who are big and yellow here that have a high degree in between this that seem to be um, hubs uh, in these pathways. So this illustrates um, something about the pathways. And so I'm going to come back to this point. Um, MET seems to have a distinct way of uh, interacting initially with um, some downstream effectors that involve cytoskeletal proteins, RAC1 and cortactin and actin. And um, EGFR interacts with a different set. And it, it's involved with, uh, it's, it's linked to clathrin and uh, CDK1, for example. Um, and um, so there's some, some, some differences and some common uh, features of these receptor interactions with downstream effectors that are coming up from these networks. So we've done a couple other uh, graphs of this type. So because we have um, both methyl transferases and acetyl transferases and deacetyl, deacetylases and demethylases, and we have modifications that involve methylation and acetyl uh, acetylation and acetylation and deacetylation. We can ask, what are the pathways uh, from histones to methyl transferases and <coughs> histones, his, histones and acetyl transferases? And again, I've highlighted some of these um, hubs that come up over and over again. RNA binding proteins, HSP90, <coughs> actin B comes up quite a lot, um, and the 1433 class of proteins. So here's a summary of this, this, um, this section here. The, the network properties degree and betweenness identify key hubs that come up in many pathways. And we think that they're likely to be nodes for signal integration. And these include HSB90, 14-3-3 phosphoserine binding proteins, RNA binding proteins, actin and microtubule binding proteins, and then a number of proteins that contain these protein interaction domains, SH3, PDZ, and limb domains. Um, <clears throat> so, and the, a, a list of these is shown on the, on the right here. At the top of those ones are the ones I highlighted, and actin, and uh, here's the protein kinase D. This is a DNA-dependent protein kinase. This is an RNA binding protein, and so on. Protein modifications, I asked, is this a result of just having highly modified proteins in the data. And one way to ask that question is to graph betweenness for all of the proteins uh, or nodes, betweenness on the x-axis and the number of modifications on the y-axis. And so what we can see is that there's a couple of proteins that are really highly modified. These are RNA binding proteins, and they have uh, 
hundreds uh, of modifications that we have in our data set, and they're known to have even more. Um, but they're not necessarily the most between. So the number of modifications, they, these proteins have more than one modification, but they don't have the most modifications. So there's, a, there's some correlation, but not a, a large correlation between the number of modifications and betweenness. Um, we can ask, uh, is degree related to betweenness? And it is. It's highly correlated. And this is a known property of biological and other types of networks um, that no degree is related to betweenness. It's not a one-to-one -one correlation, but they are highly correlated. And here I've, I've graphed the point size as the number of modifications, and you can see there are a few proteins that are highly, highly modified, but the ones with the most degree in between us are not the ones that are most highly modified with different post transfer modifications. Mark? Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah, this yeah. is Jake. Um, so my question is, you're showing the sort of betweenness and degree for your filtered networks. Um, does does the degree in betweenness of these nodes in your filtered networks differ from that in the underlying source data, the underlying global protein network? The protein-protein interaction data by itself without any filtering from the modifications is it's highly hairball-y. Um, so that means that we can get some structure from that, but it's um, I have looked into that, but there's just so many edges that it's uh, it's hard it's hard to make conclusions. But if you focused on um, these nodes that you've identified with strong sort of centrality and betweenness and degree, if you focused on on those nodes in the underlying data for the protein-protein interactions that you had, if you say took some number of, of first-degree relatives of those, as opposed to some random sample of other other things and their first degree relatives. Uh, I'm curious if what you're seeing is more a property of the underlying protein-protein interaction network or is it something that's actually being highly revealed by the, the phospho data that you have here? That's a good question, Jake, and I haven't done that, but I, I think I know how to do that. So I, I will follow up on that question. And So if I understand your question correctly, is is the um, node between this solely a property of the protein-protein interactions? I expect that it, it might be related, but um, that we will identify um, nodes with high betweenness uh, in lung cancer that have a different betweenness in other types of cancer, for example, or other types of systems. But that's a good question. I don't know the answer to it, but I can find out. This is Avi, and I think uh, Jake, intuition is correct because I can recognize those proteins as hubs in those PPI networks. I think you just need to find a way to normalize. That, that's all. I think um, it, it just raises the question of how do you normalize your uh, specific network, networks that you're analyzing by the underlying structure of the networks. And then I think once you do that, you'll, you'll start to find the differences and some really cool stuff will come out. Yeah, I think that's a good way of looking at it. If, if we find something that, that's different in this cluster filtered network versus the entire network before filtering, then that might make it more significant or, or at least highlight the differences between the lung cancer cell lines that we're studying and the general properties of these proteins from the networks. And of course, the networks are you know biased towards things that are well studied and all of that. We talk about that. So um, I'll continue. Please don't interrupt if you have more questions. That's a, those are good questions. Um, so we have highly modified proteins that may act as hubs, uh, but the number of modifications does not solely predict the hubs. And whether the hubs are predicted just by being well studied in the PPI databases, we need to we need to follow that up. That's a good point. Um, but the network properties degree and between us identify key hubs that are likely to be nodes for signal integration. And we hope there are nodes for signal integration and not just nodes that have been more studied than other nodes. That's an interesting point. So HSB90s, uh, they come up a lot. 14-3-3 uh, proteins with the dumb name that bind phosphoserine. RNA binding proteins, actin, microtubule binding proteins, and um, 
proteins with these protein interaction domains, SH3, PDC, and LIM domains. So we have also drug treatment data. And another way of looking at the data is to filter by the response to drug treatment. And so that's what I'm going to talk about next. These are the tyrosine kinases in the data that are most effective in their, mostly their phosphorylations by these different drugs. And the full change is indicated by uh, blue being negative and uh, yellow being positive. And also node size is uh, graphed as full change. So um, it's reassuring that crisotinib, which targets MET, uh, MET is the most uh, uh, down-regulated in its phosphorylation. And we also have ALK down-regulated highly in a number of other RTKs and other proteins. Iresa targets EGFR, which is the most uh, affected, also targets some related herbs. Um, and we have other proteins down-regulated. Gleevec targets PDGFRA, and Tyro-3 seems to be very down-regulated in, um, in a couple of experiments. And galvanomycin is interesting. It has effects on ALK and EGFR, but strangely upregulates phosphorylation of AXL and HERB-B3. Um, we can think about how um, drugs interact uh, in this way, you know, of course, these kinase inhibitors are uh, messy, and they bind to many different kinases. Um, but we also can think of them in terms of collaborative groups. And so these edges here are cluster filtered edges just between the tyrosine kinases I just showed you. And if we zoom in on the top two here, um, we can see that Uresa inhibits EGFR and some of the related proteins that are connected by these interactions, and less so MET. Um, MET is connected if you dig deeper into these pathways. So, for example, if you ask, uh, how do you, what are the shortest paths between each RTK and every other RTK? And this is like the previous graphs where I'm showing degree as color and betweenness as size. You can get connections to, um, from uh, MET to uh, other, other RTKs, but they seem to be a little bit farther away. So EGFR is, is over here and MET is over here. And I'm going to come back to that now by looking at the response to drugs. And on this graph, uh, the full change in response to crisotinib is graphed, and uh, MET is over here. And what's interesting about this is we, we see MET is connected to uh, proteins that are involved in cytoskeletics and adhesion. So delta catenin, cadherin, um, actin is in here. And um, we also see a potential for uh, crosstalk. So if you follow this pathway of um, ALK to IRS to GAB to LIN, LIN is uh, the, the SAR family kinase that's known to um, be able to phosphorylate uh, proteins like EGFR on those same sites that EGFR phosphorylates when it gets together and binds its ligand when it, uh, when it dimerizes. So it, it suggests not only uh, individual pathways that are activated by specific RTKs, it also suggests a possible mechanism for crosstalk involving the Sark family kinases or focal adhesion kinases, uh, focal adhesion kinase like PTK2. Iresa inhibits EGFR, and here is these, this, fam, this, uh, this pathway is uh, preserved from that last one. Again, now this is the composite shortest paths to Iresa-affected proteins. So these are all the proteins that are affected either up or down. And kinases are mostly inhibited, as shown in this graph on the right. Um, there's a couple of phosphorylations that uh, go up, uh, but mostly the, their kinases are inhibited. Um, what we find is that there's a bunch of yellow nodes here, and so the modification goes up in these. And what's interesting is um, the acetyltransferases EP300 and FASN seem to be affected by ERISA. And their acetylation is, uh, is uh, upregulated in both of the cell lines in these experiments. We also noted uh, some proteins that were um, decreased in phosphorylation 
like phosphatases. So the, down here, the phosphorylation decreases and the acetylation of these phosphatases increases. The same is true for these HSP90 uh, proteins. They increase in acetylation and decrease in phosphorylation in response to the EGF inhibitor ERESA. There's also some proteins that are dually modified. In other words, in the data, they're both acetylated and phosphorylated. And this gives rise to the hypothesis that we have a kind of, um, a kind of uh, battle going on between acetylation and uh, phosphorylation. And in fact, it, because EP300 and FASN are modified and co-cluster, and they have protein-protein interactions known from the databases, we think that these proteins may be activated by ERESA and that, this, um, that the activation of acetyltransferases is concomitant with the uh, decrease in phosphorylation. So th these are early days uh, and we're, we're trying to think some experiments up to, to try to follow this up. Uh, my graduate student Lauren Foltz is here with me. And, um, so I've looked at in the data, and there's not a, a strong argument just based on the data that we have that duly modified proteins have a higher betweenness. But if we look at the cluster filtered network duly modified proteins, they do seem to have um, more more betweenness than the other ones. And so it could be that um, uh, having dual modifications, at least with phosphorylation and acetylation. Uh, means that you're integrating signals from, from different pathways and you get different outcomes depending on the modification. So now I'm going to turn to galdanamycin. This drug has been difficult to understand and there is evidence from the literature that uh, microtubule polymerization dynamics is affected and also endocytosis, specifically the transfer of early to late uh, endosomes, which involves microtubules. And in fact, in addition to the heat shock proteins, these are heat maps showing on the left. I don't know if you can read these, but uh, heat shock proteins are affected by galdenomycin. Uh, uh, some of them are decreasing in phosphorylation and increasing in both methylation and acetylation. The biggest families of proteins that are affected by this drug are proteins known to be involved in endocytosis and known to be uh, regulating cytoskeletal dynamics in some way. And the acetyltransferases, again, several of them, but mostly FASN and EP300 are affected by galdenomycin, as shown by these heat maps. So here is, again, the, the composite shortest pass from, um, from the targets, which are the HSP90s, they're down here, to all the proteins that are affected more than twofold uh, by galdenomycin. And, um, what sort of stands out, I'm going to zoom in on this cluster down here, what sort of stands out is there's a bunch of proteins that are known to interact and co-cluster from our data. And these involve the HSP90, the acetyltransferases, EP300, and FASN, and then several other proteins. And so this suggests a, a mechanism of action that was not appreciated before, that, that the, the involvement of these acetyltransferases in regulating cytoskeletal dynamics and endocytosis uh, involves these, um, is, is the mechanism that, uh, that is disrupted by gildenomycin. So again, many of the uh, yellow nodes are upregulated in acetylation and downregulated, in, uh, in, and the blue nodes mean they're downregulated in phosphorylation. That's not uniformly true, but that does seem to be a pattern. So we have RTK signaling pathways that are elucidated, elucidated by this method. Um, they have distinct responses, met involving cytoskeletal proteins and EGFR, uh, more proteins involved in proliferation. They have distinct responses, and also they have collaborative groups, so that suggests um, common downstream effectors. And several of these uh, downstream effectors appear to be hubs that are, uh, we think are signal integrating devices um, for multiple pathways. Um, the, another conclusion is that different post-translational post modifications, especially phosphorylation and acetylation, may play dueling or um, antagonistic roles for signal transduction proteins. And we, we, of course, we've known about histone methylation and acetylation and phosphorylation having uh, different roles. But I, I did not at least appreciate that uh, cytoplasmic signaling proteins could be modified in this way, and those might have uh, different outcomes or dueling outcomes. 
And finally, we have some insight into the way gildenomycin works. It affects both phosphorylation and acetylation, and that disrupts regulation of cytoskeletal elements, especially microtubules, and endocytosis, especially the transfer of early endosomes to late endosomes. And that it seems to affect specific RTK uh, signaling pathways. So I've acknowledged these people up here. Going forward, I, we, we have involving uh, Lauren Foltz, who's a graduate student. She's sitting here. Uh, we're trying to think up some ideas to do experiments uh, to follow up some of these ideas. Uh, Travis Wheeler is in the computational science department here, and we're thinking of ways to um, make these graphs that I make more accessible. Right now, I'm using R, and I do it all myself. And uh, what uh, Avi's group has been good at, and, and Nick is working on, is making a web uh, tool that other people can use. So that's one goal. And then uh, Ekaterina or Katya Smirnova is a new faculty member in the math department. She's interested in uh, some of the uh, ways that clustering works and how, how we can tweak different values to, to look at clustering. So uh, I, I thank you. I'll take some questions. Hi, this is Alex. <coughs> I have a question. So when you choose the clusters, um, what uh, what kind of number of how do you decide how many clusters you're looking for? Do you use some like uh, maximum likelihood estimation or the number of clusters? That's a that's a good question. So um, I've used um, let's see. I have a slide about this. Yeah, if you have really large clusters, then you have, uh, then it doesn't filter the protein-protein interaction networks very well. And that's one of the questions that uh, I'd like to look at in a more mathematically rigorous way. Um, I did it empirically. I, I, I picked clusters that were less than 80 to keep, and anything greater than 80, I additionally parsed them using this penalized matrix decomposition. And um, <clears throat> the reason to do that is because I wanted I wanted um, the clusters to be small enough to really filter those protein-protein interactions and also to be very you know, rigorous. And I showed you examples of what the clusters look like. I wanted them to be very well-defined clusters. So at this point, uh, the answer to your question, if I understand it correctly, is it was an empirical choice to, to choose this number 80. But I think mm -hmm. what we want to do is uh, carefully tweak the, the, the the clustering and see what the results for the cluster filtering network are. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Thanks. Yeah. So uh, if I can ask you some technical question, Mark. So, so when you are subsetting these uh, networks, you do this all in R and then just push things to cytoscape, uh, like when you are looking for paths between different proteins and all these kind of things. Yes, I do it all in R, and th the reason is practical. I, I wanted to um, graph this and have the ability to zoom in and explore, but it turns out this requires a huge amount of memory and um, Java and graphics capability. So right now I'm doing it all in R, <clears throat> and um, I, I, one of the goals is to, to make it more accessible, you know, that you, that you could actually navigate the data structure and drive around and zoom and select and, and things, but um, I haven't figured out how to do that yet. That, that's uh, what Travis and his students are going to be looking at. So it's all in R. Right, but I mean, you know, this, this kind of uh, analysis by visual uh, inspection approaches do have certain drawbacks, so I think postulating hypotheses the way you do it and then computationally extracting relevant subnetworks seem a bit more uh, rigorous than to kind of chasing some clumps of yellows and blues and that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. They're just by chance, right? True. Otherwise, I, the, and it's a good reason why, why which ones of them are significant or not and which ones are just, you know, random fluctuations. Yeah, I... I Having done this now for a while, I don't know how anybody could do this kind of thing without being able to program, and R is great for that. Um, on the other hand, um, you, if you do have a web tool, you open up opportunities for crowdsourcing creativity. Um, you know, people can 
you know, they, they, they can, pe people are good at pattern recognition. Machine learning techniques are good, but people turn out to be better. So if you could figure out a way to harness uh, people's brains, um, that, that might be fruitful. I don't know. I, I haven't solved that problem, but that was kind of what I was thinking at the outset of this. Has anybody proved that that's actually correct? <laughs> that, you know, it's uh, people can see patterns, statistically significant patterns better than statistical. Well, what comes to mind is uh, this study where the Hubble was looking at these deep space, space objects. And some of them you can classify based on known structures. There's a whole bunch of stuff out there that nobody knows what the hell they are. And they just want to bin them. And it turns out that just having people look and uh, binning them based on their shape and color, that's more effective than any kind of pattern recognition uh, software. Uh, so for, for things that are unknown and, and uh, shapes, I guess these pattern recognition techniques are getting much better. Another example was it used to be that no, no computer could play the game Go, but, uh, but now there is a computer that can play Go well and win, and so that's a new development. So maybe we can rely on the computer algorithms. To okay, well, if there are no more questions, um, I'd like to thank Mark again for a great presentation, and uh, we will process the video and make it available uh, on the DCIC website. So you will be able to go back and check it out. Uh, Mark, if you could share also your slides, that would be great. If not, that's fine too. So I will do that. Thanks for the opportunity and all of your questions.